today on John Osteen. And when we got the news that I had metastatic cancer of the liver 15 days before Christmas, on December 10th, 1981, we just felt utter devastation. It was right here in this hospital that a doctor got me aside in a little room and said, Pastor, I have bad news for you. Your wife will be dead within a few weeks. There's not anything we can do for her. No treatment that we know that we can give her. Her life is over. Just make up your mind. She's going to die within a few weeks. This is John Osteen. Ministry of Compassion. Reaching the unreached and telling the untold. Proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for you. Ladies and gentlemen, from Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, here is John Osteen. Welcome to the program today. We're so glad you've tuned in. I'm standing in front of St. Luke's Hospital in the great medical center in Houston, Texas. In 1981, my wife Dodie was in this hospital for 20 days trying to find out what was wrong with her body. I remember one day the doctor came to me at the end of those tests and said, Pastor, I've got bad news for you. Your wife has metastatic cancer of the liver. She cannot live. She'll be dead within a few weeks. That was sad news. I said to the doctor, we believe in miracles. He said, you're going to have to have a miracle for her to live. I looked at him and I said, we're going to get that miracle. I lifted Dodie out of that bed. She weighed 89 pounds, put her in a wheelchair and took her home. We got on our faces before the Lord and, and we pled his promises. And I'm glad to announce that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, healed Dodie. And this is 1987 when we're making this program. Six years ago, the Lord healed her. And I want you to see her well and healthy and happy. Truly a 20th century miracle. Today she's going to update you on her testimony. Take heart. What Jesus did for Dodie, he'll do for you. so glad that you joined us today on our television broadcast and John has been preaching a series of messages to you about 20th century miracles and so I'm going to continue to tell you about another great 20th century miracle and that miracle happened to me and uh, we felt that it would bless you and give you hope if some of you are fighting diseases in your body or things have come against you in other ways and you don't know exactly how to cope with it if you don't have any hope from doctors are from people in the world, then you always have hope from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is still on the throne, and he is still a prayer answering God. Did you know that? Aren't you glad? <laughs> Glory to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I can look over our congregation and see miracles. Oh, I see so many miracles. And Jesus is still in the miracle working business. I want you to know that. Some of you need a miracle from God, and he is there. He is there just as close as the very breath that you breathe, and he will give you a miracle if you do what his word says. I had the word of God to depend on. Thank God I had had teaching for all these many years about healing and about other things and about how to get what I wanted from God. If I hadn't, have, I would have died. I can see people sitting out here. I see Beverly sitting back here 16 years ago healed of cancer. Uh, little Terry uh, sit, sitting someplace out here. His mother is always here. Terry Burton was born with a brain the size of a quarter. No hopes, the doctor said he would be a vegetable. His little head was enlarged, but his mother found out the place that it was written in the Word of God. So that's what you need to do. If you're fighting a battle in your health or wherever, whatever, then find where it is written in the Word of God. In 1981, I was in the hospital for 20 days. I went in just for some tests because I'd been sick for three weeks. Uh, I'd had a lot of symptoms, which I won't go into because it's just not edifying and it won't do you any good. And it brings back bad memories to me. 
But I finally went into the hospital to have some tests done. Just supposed to have stayed two or three days. Their first diagnosis was that I had a tumor the size of an orange on my liver, plus two smaller tumors, and they thought that it was probably an abscess, a liver abscess that I'd picked up from some other country. Well, after several days of tests, tests that just completely wore me out, the doctor met John in the hospital on December 10th, 15 days before Christmas of 1981, and said, Pastor, before we go up to your wife's room, before I go tell her, I want you to know that I have found that she has metastatic cancer of the liver. And of course, John was just stunned. I mean, here we thought that I would have first of all been out of the hospital in two or three days, and it had gone on and on and on with more tests and this and that. And here I was in there 20 days, thought I was gonna get to go home every day because I had begun to improve. And then we came up with the diagnosis, or they did, with metastatic cancer of the liver. There was no primary tumor, and that's a very unusual thing. It was almost demonic from the very beginning because there was no place that the cancer had spread from. They did so many tests, and they said, we cannot tell how to treat her until we find out what, where the cancer is, where it has spread from. And uh, they suggested doing more surgery, uh, doing surgery, either a... a exploratory surgery or a colonoscopy but by that time I weighed 89 pounds and I didn't feel like going through any other test I was just completely exhausted and so when he met John in the entrance of the St. Luke's Hospital there he said pastor your wife has cancer I'm going up to the room to tell her John said will you just please wait and let me um, tell her myself and he said Doctor, we believe in miracles. Jesus is a miracle worker. And he said, Pastor, you're going to need a miracle. So when I found out about it, I was, of course, devastated. The whole family was devastated. Here I had finally gotten to the point where I could enjoy life a little because I didn't have little children. And uh, I'd been well all my life. And then all of a sudden was struck with the news of cancer of the liver with a tumor the size of an orange, uh, a fairly large orange, and then two smaller ones the size of almonds. So John decided that, well, we're just going to go ahead and take you home. He, as head of the house, decided this, and I'm glad because I, I was just absolutely worn out in the hospital. So he said to the doctor, we're going to take her home and we're going to pray and seek God. And the doctor said, well, pastor, you're really going to need a miracle. I don't want you to keep her at home longer than 10 days. And so we went home and I can remember so well going home in the middle of the five o'clock traffic. We just dropped everything at the hospital and put me in the car as weak as I was and started home in the five o'clock traffic. I can remember when we got out on 59 because we lived in Umble and I, I heard my husband sobbing in the back seat of the car. Their family was absolutely stunned because here their mother had been all healthy and well all these years and they had never seen me when I was idle. My, one of my sons says, my mother works all the time. I have never seen her when she wasn't working. And then, just all of a sudden, to have news like that. But you know what? I had hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. If I hadn't had hope in God and His Word, I would have died. And I had the hope and the assurance that whatever is, His Word is forever settled in heaven. Whatever God promised, He was fully able to perform. And so, uh, after I had gotten home, we, I decided that I would not go to bed. I was tired and I was exhausted. I went to bed only during the times when I was supposed to sleep. And the next morning, I got up on the 11th of December. John and I got on our faces in our bedroom, and we prayed. And he, as head of the house, rebuked that cancer in my body. And I set the date of December the 11th, 1981, as the date that I was healed. Now, I'd advise you, if you're fighting a battle, It'd be a good thing for you if you'd like to, to set a date because I think that when the devil comes against you and torments you in the middle of the night like he did me, you can always say, no devil, take your hands off of me because on December 11th, I believe I received my healing. I say that every day when I awake in the morning and if I forget to say it, I say it later on in, in the day because I believe that on that day, God began the healing process of cancer in my body. John commanded that cancer to wither and die. It began to die, as far as I'm concerned, on that day, although it didn't seem like that the cells in my body had died. It seemed like that cancer was overruling my body and overtaking me. And in the middle of the night, especially, it was hard because everybody else would be asleep and I would be awakened in the night thinking, a, a tumor the size of an orange, this is terrible. It looks like I'm gonna die. 
and I would have to replace those thoughts and cast down imaginations and bring every thought into captivity to the, to the obedience of Christ and think of, of Scripture. And I would always replace it with something like, by the stripes of Jesus, he's healed, or himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, or uh, with long life he satisfies me and shows me his salvation. I've made out a list of Scriptures, and I have them still written down. I go over them every morning because Proverbs 4, 20 and 21 says, my son or my daughter, attend to my words. Don't let them incline your ear to them. Don't let them depart from your eyes. So every morning, I still read these healing scriptures, and I have a whole lot of them. I think about 40 passages that I read every day. Now, you say, did you have an easy time? I didn't have an easy time at all. I ha had a hard time. There were times when I was so tired and so sick that I felt like giving up. I had some abnormal bleeding. Everything came against me. It just seemed like one thing would stop and another thing would start. And I became so disheartened. And I tried to not say anything about it. Nobody knew anything about it. When people would ask me how I felt, I'd say, I'm blessed to the Lord, thank you, or I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. If that, I would have really told them how I felt. I would have just fallen down in a little pile on the floor and cried and said, I feel awful but we're snared by the words of our mouth. Did you know that? He who guards his mouth preserves his life. Now, you have a choice of either saying bad things or good things about yourself. If you've been in the habit of saying bad things, then change it and begin to say good things. You can always say, well, God promised me in, promises me in my word that he's healed me by the stripes of Jesus. You can find a good scripture and stand on it. Jeremiah 30, 17, for he has restored health unto me and healed me of my wounds. Call things that be not as though they were. God called the world into existence, so that's what you'll have to do. You'll have to call things that be not as though they were. And if you feel like you'll never get well, just picture yourself well. I got some pictures of me. One of them, I was riding a horse out on a, a ranch. That's one thing I asked Jesus to do. I said, Father, I want to feel like I did when I was that age, when I was riding that horse. I got a picture of me in my wedding dress, and I said, Jesus, I want to feel like I did the day I got married. And I kept those things in my mind. And when things came against me, I would remember those pictures. And I had them on my dresser so I could see them. I did everything that I knew to do. I think if somebody would have told me to go stand in the corner at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for three hours, I would have done it because I wanted so much to get well. I just wanted to do everything that I knew I had done. And when I had examined myself, when I had asked God to forgive me, when I had written some letters that I needed to write that I felt uh, that maybe would hinder my healing, I thought about the scripture in Ephesians. It says, having done all, stand. Just stand on the Word of God. I did like I heard Brother Raymond T. Ritchie do when he had tuberculosis. He put his Bible on the floor and stood on it. I thought, well, if Brother Ritchie did it and it'll help me, I'll do it. So I got my Bible and I put it on the floor and I stood on it. Now, that doesn't mean anything to anybody except me, but I imagine it touched the heart of Jesus, don't you think? You have to get to a point where you just stand on the Word of God and God will see you through it. When I would get so weak that I thought I couldn't go on, I'd remember the scriptures on strength. One of them, Isaiah 27, 5, let us take hold of his strength. And I'd reach up just sometime when I was there by myself, I would think, Father, I can't go on. I'm too sick. I'm too tired. But I just take hold of your strength. And it seemed like he just refreshed me and gave me strength. So many times I had to get alone and cry because I was hurting so bad. You think... You may think that, that some of the times that I was crying here at the Oasis, that it was compassion. It was not compassion. Although, you know, I was concerned about the needs of people, it was the very fact that I was sick and I was hurting and I could hardly stand to be here. But I knew if I got out and did for others, if I ministered to others, then God would bless me. So I, I remember one time when I felt so bad, I had a pain in my side that lasted too long. I mean, for me to even tell you, I don't even want to tell you how long it lasted. There was no known cause for the pain. It was just there. But of course, I was tormented by the fact that there was a malignant tumor there that had started, the primary tumor. So I just had to keep fighting that thought and kept on going. Believe in God and calling things that be not as though they were. Believe in God that one day that pain would be gone. And it left. Thank God. I have no pain in my body. It's so wonderful. But uh, you just don't know how wonderful it is. But if you're fighting a battle in your life or with your health, just remember,
to keep on fighting. Stand on the Word of God, and He'll bring it to pass. Now, you might wonder, some of you who are watching, is it really God's will to heal me? It is God's will to heal you. When the leper came to Jesus, he said, Jesus said, what can I do for you? And he said, Master, if you will, you can make me whole. Jesus said two simple little words, I will. See, sometimes people are hung up on the fact that it's not God's will or either they're not worthy of healing. If you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, then you're worthy of God's healing. Just come to Jesus as a little child and say, Father, I need healing. I want you to help me or whatever you need. Find the place where it's written. If it's healing, find you some healing scriptures. If it's for finances, find you some financial scriptures. My God shall supply all your needs. John and I even made out a contract. I just happened to have some of these things. I had a, a little notebook with the things in it. I had them written down. Father, I want you to do this for me. I want you to heal me of this pain in my back where they did the biopsy, which lasted for so long. And uh, I had shortness of breath for three and a half weeks after I came out of the hospital. I said, I want you to take the shortness of breath away and pain away and this and that. And I made this long list. And I, as they would come to pass, I'd check it off. When the shortness of breath left in three and a half weeks, I'd check that off. Well, John and I made a, us up a contract one day, and I have it here. I keep it on my dresser at home. And, uh, and we decided some things that we wanted to happen in our body, that we wanted to line up with the Word of God. And I put mine, and then I wrote his, and then we signed it. And uh, I signed it at 3.42 p.m. in the afternoon when we were driving down the freeway. And I signed my name, and he signed his name. And then I said, I don't think Jesus will mind if I sign his name. So that meant that the three of us were in agreement, and we had a contract. <laughs> Glory. Occasionally, when symptoms come against either one of us, we'll say, remember the contract, remember the contract. That's good. Glory to Jesus. Find you some healing scriptures. There are a lot of good ones. The one, another one that I stood on so much of the time, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. Now, there were a lot of times when I wavered, and I began to get so upset about that condemnation, everything came on me, and I had to fight. But when I would waver, I'd think, God, I'm not believing your word. So I asked John one day, I said, John, what is it? I'm wavering too much. I'm holding fast my confession of faith, but I'm wavering. But I know God is faithful who promised. And he said, Dodie, are you wavering in your head or your heart? I said, I got real adamant. I said, I'm not wavering in my head, in my, in my heart because God's Word is in my heart, and He would never lie to me. And He said, then where are you wavering? And I said, well, in my head. And then He said, well, who's the accuser of the brethren? And I knew it was the devil that was making me waver in my head. So I got rid of that thought. But anyway, I pressed on and on and on, and I called things that be not as though they were, and I reminded God of His Scriptures. Oh, and they're so wonderful. And I kept thinking whenever it looked like I was going to die, that I was so sick that I, it looked like I was going to die. With long life, he satisfies me and shows me his salvation. And I said, God, I'm not satisfied yet. My husband needs me. My children need me. And I am needed by my flock. And I'm not satisfied. And I don't want to die. There's a scripture in here that says, no grave trouble will come a, a, upon the, un the righteous. And, of course, that doesn't mean grave, grave, you know, like a grave a cemetery. But I ha kept that in my mind. I said, no grave trouble is going to come against me. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Whenever we pass a cemetery to this day, I say, with long life, he satisfies me and shows me his salvation. It happens to be right now there's not a cemetery on the way to church. So I've made me up two or three. There's a big monument thing. If I pass anything that reminds me of a cemetery, I say, with long life, he satisfies me and shows me his salvation. But I found the place where it was written. And um, you know what? God doesn't love me any more than he loves you. And he can do whatever he needs, what you need to be done in your life. God is a good God. And he, Jesus died that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The thing that people get mixed up is who causes this? Was it God? I have people say to me sometime, a lady too, not too long ago said, my little granddaughter has leukemia and I'm mad at God and I hadn't prayed in three weeks. And I thought, honey, you're mad at the wrong person. You're not going to get your prayers answered even when you pray if you've got that attitude because God is not the one that sends sickness. It's the devil. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10 10 says that. So you get in your mind that it's not God that sent it to begin with. It's the devil. 
And when you get that straight, then you know that God is a God of love and that Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I went through a battle, but then, you know, it was like being in a long, dark tunnel. And I could see no light for a while. But I knew that God's Word would not lie to me and that I had, had been healed on December the 11th. I knew that it wasn't God's fault that I was missing it somewhere, so I would pray and seek God and find out where I was missing it. Sometime I had to do some changing. I'm a very fast repenter, but the thing that I want to encourage you about is to watch what comes out of your, your mouth because that's so important. If you've been confessing negative things, then change and start saying God's Word. You can never go wrong by saying God's Word. There's a scripture that says, let your hand become my help. The hand of God is your help. And God is so faithful, and He wants you to be well. Now, I came out of that tunnel. I came out through the Word of God and by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I, it wasn't an instant thing. It took a long, long time. And I saw no light in that tunnel until after, well, too long for me to even tell you, I began to see rays of light, and I began to get encouragement and to think, well, you know, God's Word is working. There are times when it doesn't seem like it's working, but it does. So if you go through the time in your life or in the battle that you're in where it doesn't seem like it's working, just remember, it is. His Word is forever settled in heaven. Keep standing on the Word of God. Uh, I, last year, I went for my just routine cancer smear, pap smear, and uh, they did routine blood work. This is the report I got back. You can't see it on television, but there were 36 tests done. The ones that are liver function tests are underlined. Every one of my tests was in the normal range. Down at the bottom, there's a, a little note from the nurse that said, great, and three exclamation points, Pam. She told me that the, doc the uh, ladies there in the office were looking over this report, and they came to this one that was perfect, which is not always true because there are usually some variances. And they said, look at this blood work. It is perfect. And another one said, well, whose is that? And they said, that's Dodie Osteen's blood work. And they said, no wonder. <laughs> Glory. So the thing that I would encourage you about is just to get the Word of God in your heart, find the place where it's written, and remember that God will not lie. He is not a man that he shall lie. Find you somebody to pray with you and believe God, set you a date and believe God and God will see you through it. Now I want to ask John to come and stand with me and I'm going to pray uh, for people because I believe it'll help them. Praise God. Wasn't that good? Amen. Well, let's praise the Lord. Amen. No hope. The doctor said she had to die within a few weeks. No medication could help her. And yet, there's not a trace of cancer in her body today. Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. And she's told you some things today that you have to do. You're not always going to get it easy. You just have to stand on the Word of God. Here's what a doctor said. This is on the back of her book, Healed of Cancer. After studying Dodie Osteen's medical records, carefully I told her and Pastor Osteen that considering the kind of cancer that she had, they could never fully appreciate the magnitude of her healing. Amen. Well, can you say an amen? amen? Amen. Praise God. I'm going to join hands with her and she's going to pray. And let's believe everyone here and everyone out there will not give up hope, but will trust in the Lord and be healed. Amen. Now, I want to pray, and as I pray, I'm going to have to keep my eyes open so I can look to you because I feel like I'm close to you when I look at you. You say, well, why are you praying with your eyes open? It's just because I want to because I feel like I'm there with you. But Father, I pray for these people yes. that are watching us by television. God, some of them need miracles. Father, some of them are so desperately ill. Some of them have so many problems, my Father. But God, you are the problem solver. So I'm asking you, Father, in the name of your son Jesus, that you will touch them. Oh, God, touch them and heal their bodies, yes. Father. 
Heal their bodies, Father. I rebuke diseases. I rebuke cancer, and I command it to wither and die. I rebuke heart disease. I rebuke other diseases, and I command it to go in Jesus' name. Devil, take your hands off these people. We serve you notice. You're a liar and the father of all lies, and I command you to take your hands yes. off them with diseases in Jesus' name. Now, God, whatever it is that they need, Father, if it's finances, whatever, if it's a wayward child, if it's a child on drugs, move, God. I pray that on yes. this day, as they see this television broadcast, that things will turn around in their lives. Yes. This curse that's been upon them with the children or disease or whatever, I command it to go in Jesus' name, and we reverse the curse, and we speak blessings to them in Jesus' name. Thank you, my Father, that you will answer that you love them and that you'll answer because you love them and because we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. It's good to see a 20th century miracle, and that's exactly what Dodie Osteen is. As I said at the beginning of the program, I'm standing here in front of the St. Luke's Hospital in the great medical center in Houston, Texas. It was right in this building. The doctor told me, Brother Osteen, Pastor Osteen, your wife will be dead within a few weeks. There's nothing we can do for her. Well, you saw her six years later. There's not a sign of cancer in her body. Thank God she's a 20th century miracle. I want to remind you that what Jesus did for Dodie, he can do for, for you and will do if you look to him. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lift your eyes away from the abilities of men to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will give you your miracle. 